بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده وصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرا باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الانسان من علق اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الانسان ما لم يعلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب today very quickly i want to talk about the quran before the diacritical marks and understanding what that really means so in order to understand this the first place we must turn to is the quran itself and we're going to look at three different places of the quran that talk about what was the quranic view of itself okay the quran's view of itself so we're going to look at that inshallah ta'ala <coughs> First of all, Bismillah walhamdulillah, when the Qur'an was revealed, Allah said, Ikra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Read what? Ikra' is a command. Command to read what? Command to read Qur'an, right? Well, it starts out orally, and then what does Allah say at the end? Ikra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, ikra' wa rabbuka al-akram. And notice how ikra' is referred to twice. Just keep this in mind. It'll be useful as we continue our discussion. So, Iqra, first time, and then Iqra, wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil-qalam. Read in the name of your Lord, who is most gracious. Okay? Alladhi allama bil-qalam. He taught by the pen. Allama l-insana ma lam ya'lam. And he taught man what he did not know. Now this, what is it that the Qur'an mentions that you did not know? What did he teach you? Well, the ikra, the recitation, the recitation, the oral tradition, it starts out with oral tradition, and then allama bil qalam, he taught you what you did not know. What did he teach you that you did not know? Well, let's see what the Qur'an says about that. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا Like we have sent a messenger amongst you. مِنْكُمْ From amongst you. What does he do? يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْكُمْ He recites to you. آيَاتِنَا are signs. وَيُزَكِّكُمْ And he purifies you. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابِ And he teaches you the book. What is halal? What is haram? وَالْحِكْمَ And he gives you the wisdom. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ And he teaches you this book and he teaches you مَا لَمْ تَكُونُ تَعْلَمُونَ What you did not know before this, Allah teaches you through this book. So with this in mind, now, what is it that Allah is teaching us and teaching the companions of the Prophet ﷺ? That they did not know it is this Qur'an. And what is being asked to recite? It is this Qur'an. But Allah says, we will... And we taught them with the pen. Why? Because from the day one, the Qur'an was being put into writing. And one of the very first surahs, okay, is all Sustul Qalam. And there is a sign here, an indication here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon, Noon, and by the pen by which they write. Meaning the pen, what are they, what is Allah swearing by? What is the pen writing? It is the words of Allah. And this is why it is followed by وَمَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ O Nabi Muhammad Wasallam, You have not gone insane. This Qur'an is not a byproduct of something evil. No, this is wahi. This is revelation. This is from the divine. This is something that comes outside the world of this seen world, the world of cosmos. It breaks through the fabric of time and space and it comes to you Wasallam. نون والقلم وما يسترون وما أنت بنعمة ربك بمجنون. Because the Quran was meant to be moving from an oral tradition into a written tradition. Please mind you this. Okay, mind this point. It's very very important point. Still, Alaq, the first surah revealed to the Quran in the Quran, tells the Prophet that read and also tells him put it in writing because this writing will teach people what they do not know meaning what was the prophet com has come to teach he's come to teach the quran and wahi khafi and jali meaning quran jali meaning the quran and khafi meaning the wahi that is uh, manifested through his 
Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu All of that. Okay? And so all of that will be taught by the pen. So the Quran will be taught by the pen and indirectly, there's an indication, even hadith literature would be taught by the pen. I don't want to go into that hadith part right now because we're focusing on the diacritical marks of the Quran before the revelation. But we want to understand the Quranic self-image from the Quran. And so the Quran is telling us that it is going to go from recitation to a form of writing, to a form of a book. And thus the Quran calls itself almost as if a prophecy. It is calling itself a kitab, a book. Even though in the beginning it wasn't a book. But very early on, the Qur'an started calling itself a book. Now the word book, kitab, also means law, the divine law. Okay, And so, يُعَلِّمُكُمُ kitab. He taught you the book, meaning what is halal and haram. But there is a prophecy, ذَلِكَ kitab. Even in early Madani phase, this is the book. Meaning, this is a book, oh, when the Prophet is in Medina, and he is being told this is the book, just like the previous ummahs had a book. Like the Tawrat and like the Injil, this is also a book. And this is the Al-Kitab, the final book of the Prophet ﷺ. What else does the Qur'an... So the Qur'an tells us that it is going from oral tradition to written tradition. Now this is very important because when you have an oral tradition and when you have a written tradition, they're there to confirm each other. They're there to confirm each other. When the companions of the Prophet ﷺ put the Qur'an into a written tradition, that was taken from the Prophet. First, Abu Bakr is the actual Jami'ul Qur'an. He is the actual first person to combine the Qur'an together in the form of a Mus'haf. It was Uthman radiallahu an who gave it its Rasm, how things will be spelled out properly. Jami'ul Rasmul Qur'an is Uthman radiallahu an. And he was an expert in Qur'an. Even though there's some debate about some of these issues, I'm just taking the general view. So people understand things from a general perspective. So we have two traditions. We have the oral tradition, and then we have the written tradition. Now, what does the Quran tell us about this from Surah Al-Qiyamah? Okay, so now let us study this issue from Surah Al-Qiyamah before we go to uh, specifics. Okay. <clears throat> the Prophet is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تحرك لسانك O Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't worry. There's, don't be in a hurry because Allah is going to do His plan. Allah is going to make His plan happen. لا تحرك به meaning with this Quran. لسانك your tongue, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. لتعجل به so that you're in a hurry that this message, because the Prophet didn't have to memorize Qur'an. Wahi came and it was fixed in his heart. al It became fixed in his heart. It was put into his heart and it was there. Okay, The Prophet didn't have to learn Qur'an in the sense that when we talk about, in the sense I and you learn Qur'an. The Prophet didn't go through that process. He didn't have to go through that process. Because that's the nature of Wahi. لا تحرك به لسانك صلى الله عليه وسلم لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه. It is on us to gather this Quran and to have it then recited. So the first is the recitation for which Allah says لا تحرك لسانك لتعجل به. Don't recite this Quran quickly. Okay. ورط القرآن ترتيلا. So don't go outside this صلى الله عليه وسلم إن علينا and the Prophet didn't do it to disrespect Qur'an, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, never, ever, no. He was, why well, he was coming and it was putting it into his heart and he was just in a, in a hurry, like when Musa a.s. was in a hurry to see Allah, like that, you know. So, لا تحرك لسانا, oh don't worry, don't worry, don't stress, oh Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we're going to, uh, we're going to take this Qur'an and gather it perfectly for you, okay. Inna alayna, it is on us. Jama'ahu, the gathering of this Qur'an and Qur'ana and reciting it. What is this talking about, Jama'ahu? Now, scholars have disagreed what this is referring to. It's referring to one of the two things. Either the Jama'ah is in the heart of the Prophet. And of course, the Jama'ah is obviously in the heart of the Prophet. But the second meaning of Jama'ah, 
that many scholars have taken is that it is the jama of Quran after it's been completely revealed. And as it is being completely revealed, the Prophet had 50 scribes who were writing down the Quran. The Prophet would re tell them to write. They would write. And then the Prophet would say, read it back to me. They would read back to the Prophet. I'll show you this if I have time. And, the, and so there was a written format being put into place. And there was the oral tradition. The Prophet was teaching everyone. But here's the issue. That uh, imagine, okay, and I'm going to show you a, a, a YouTube video that also goes over this and why this written and oral tradition side by side from the very beginning. Mind you, that Umar radiallahu anh became Muslim where? He became Muslim in Mecca. And Khabab bin Art was teaching Quran. In what form? In a scroll. And now we have those manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts of Quran from Manchester University that goes directly into the time of the Prophet. And you know, when I first time received uh, these copies on the internet, downloaded them, I looked at each and every word, every single word, and every single word was in perfect place, in perfect harmony to the Quran that we have today, 100%. Okay, it's great news, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allah is so kind, He's given us this fascinating miracle, the Quran, absolutely, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Quran was... So Khabab bin Art, that's when Umar radiallahu, he said, show it to me and he read it. And it was Sutu Taha according to some versions. And he was like, wow, this is this. He just had to give in to the message and he became Muslim. Okay. So now, so the Quran was being put into the writing and then there was the oral tradition. But the oral tradition wasn't, was, had many, you can say, uh, things going on. Why? Because the Arabs were different places speaking different ways. And it was not possible for them all to recite Qur'an the same because there were many variations of Arabic language within Arabia. Okay, so there were many variations and, the, and so in the early days it was allowed for them to recite in their variations accordingly. And some of the, and this is Wahi, okay, as all of this is Wahi, all of its different variations the Prophet allowed was given it was the prophet was given these in different variations that they recited in different areas of the arab world but the main dialect of the quran would be the Quraishi dialect it's a very important point this is what the prophet said وسلم, the main one would be in the Quraishi dialect but the prophet is also having quran written and he's also teaching it orally okay why because now i will share with you why because of the great wisdom in some of this. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa qur'ana. It is on us to gather this Qur'an and have it recited. The second meaning of jama'a. So the first one is in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. That the Qur'an would be gathered in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And then it would be recited from there. Meaning the version of recitation set by Uthman after now many years have passed. People have had a chance to become acquainted with Qur'an. They have gotten familiar with Qur'an. And now this recitation of the Qur'ayshi dialect is going to be the main rasam and qira based upon that. Okay? So the first is the recitation and then is the written form. لا تحرك لسانك لتعجلبي O Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't move your tongue in haste of this Qur'an. Inna alayna jama'ahu. It is on us to gather this Qur'an in your heart. And then after that from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would first learn recitation. Then they would, the companions would come together and put the Qur'an in the form of a book. So this jama'ahu is referring to either the heart of the Prophet or it is referring to the written script that would come in the future. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Qur'an. It is on us to gather it and have it recited. Okay. One example of the heart of the Prophet is in the last year of the last Ramadan, the Quran, the Prophet recited the Quran twice to Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam and sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the example of the Qur'an being gathered by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, that is well known that the companions gathered the Qur'an in the form of a book at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So, إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ 
So if you take the meaning of gathering the Qur'an in the form of a book, وَقُرْآنَ And now we will have you recite it from this book. That's what Uthman did. He made them recite from that one book, that one standard version. Okay? فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ Then when it is recited, فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ Then follow that recitation. Okay? ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ And then it is on us to explain it. And then Allah sent so many people, so many great people to explain Qur'an from different perspectives, from the perspective of purification of the soul, from the perspective of Islamic law, what is fair al-amr, what is halal, what is haram, what are the conditions of each, right? According to fiqh, then Allah explained it through the language itself, tafsirs of lugha, like zamakshari and so on and so forth, and the tafsir bin riwaya. And so many different ways Allah used to explain Qur'an and more expanding Qur'an. Now we have a subject called Qur'an and science. And like this Qur'an and the social sciences. And like this, the Qur'an was explaining itself and expanding and expanding. Okay, so don't worry. This Qur'an is going to go and expand and it's going to become vast. So now what happened? Okay, so now let's understand some things. Basic things, inshallah ta'ala. So, what I want to be clear is the Quran, whether you're looking at Sutul uh, Alaq, Ikra, and then Alama bil Qalam, or Noon wal Qalam wa ma yisturun, you're looking at Sutul Qiyamah, la tuharrik bihi lisanaka li ta'ajala bi, inna alayna jama'ahu wa Qur'ana. Right? When you're looking at all of this, there's the recitation of the tongue and the mouth, and then there is the written form. So these two things are going side by side. Why? Because it's very important. You know, um, this is a self-correcting mechanism Allah gave. That the written, and the written was there, written. Okay, because Abu Bakr, when he was rearranging and compiling, he had everybody come. I'm not going to go over the whole story, but in short, for every the two scribes for every ayah. Come and show me. The Prophet dictated this to you. Show me the verse. Okay? And this is in addition to the Hufaz that already existed. So two people, two scribes of the Prophet who had taken the dictation, come and show me. Okay? And then it was confirmed and confirmed until the whole written Qur'an was confirmed because the Qur'an was not revealed in the sequence that would be in the book. And certainly as Imam Suyuti has mentioned and many other scholars have mentioned the Prophet used to be told by Jibreel this verse goes here and this verse goes here and this verse goes and so the arrangement of the Quran the written Quran the arrangement of the written Quran was written in it was given in the written form and also taught to the companions of the Prophet but the companions of the Prophet also recited Quran in different ways now I don't have time to go into all of this we're going to look at some aspects of this Okay. This is very, very important to understand that the written form and the written standard, the role it played, okay, because people were reciting in many different ways, according to their dialects, according to their, uh, according to their understanding, they were reciting. And sometimes uh, those recitations, uh, and then also people were spelling words in different ways. Uh, I can give examples of that in some of the mushaf, for example, uh, uh, Musaytir, it's the uh, Ghashia. Uh, the Saad has a scene over it because it's recited as the actual spelling is seen, but it is that scene is is pronounced as Saad. So in some there were spelling issues. Sometimes it was recitation issues. So the there had to be a combining of the oral and the and uh, meaning the confirming of the oral and the written together to put it in the form of a standard book. Why was it given one standard book? And what is the advantage of that? I'm going to tell you that, inshallah. Because that, if I'm able to explain to you what I want to explain to you, you're going to actually see the miraculousness and the, the dynamicness of this. And you'll understand what happened because of the diacritical marks. Uh, which is good and, uh, in some ways, handicapping. Okay? That's what I'll say. It's, it's handicapping because... When the original text was there, the original writing was there. For example, when you say Maliki Omiddin or Maliki Omiddin, the original text didn't have the harakas. So 
the Sahaba were able to read the Quran according to the riwayats, the mass tradition, mass transmission riwayats that the Prophet. Well, at the time, at that time, the early on, there was no mass transmission because they were directly the recipients of the Quran. So the those that were taught or read Maliki Yomidin meme right Maliki Yomidin the the spelling the, without the dots without the haraka the person that reads Maliki Yomidin will also read Maliki Yomidin from the same script that was written by Abu Bakr and then later on Uthman from the same same script he would be able to read the different riwayas okay the different mass transmissions the different qiraas okay so this is something very important to no. Now let us <coughs> move uh, forward, inshallah ta'ala, on this. <coughs> so originally the Quran had no diacritical marks. And to put the dots, I'm not even talking about the diacritical marks of Fata Dama and Kasra and the muds and everything. I'm talking about putting the dots. The Arabs expected the person to be able to read the script without dots. And they considered it as a, how weak is this person? He needs dots? Okay, uh, Madaini has written that a person that puts dots on the Quran to read the script, okay, his comprehension should be questioned. His his comprehension is suspicious, because why does he need to put the dots? So this is how they felt it was like in, in, an insult to that you you need me to you think I can't figure out what this word is saying without the dots? I can't look at the context and tell what what is if what word this is. Right, so they looked at it as kind of like uh, looking. They didn't look at it with a good view to put dots, but of course, later on, as the the mastery of the Arabs uh, and a lot of people became Muslim and started learning Arabic, then for their comprehension, these things were put there. But it was never with the idea that you would become completely dependent upon it. Always, the idea was that this is there to help you. But, uh, but you're not a master really until you know you can read without tashkil and the dots. Okay, so now we're taking a look at one of the the earliest manuscript we have. Okay, so this is like if you can see here, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I hope you can see this, right? And then you see these dots uh, over here to show that this is a ending. So the original script has Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim written here to differentiate it from the previous surah okay the surah na names are not mentioned it's not mentioned in it if it's makki or madni okay it's not mentioned the number of ayahs sometimes you know we have qurans with the surah name in it in bold letters if it's makki or madni how many uh so none of that okay there's no there's none of there's no dots here there's no harakas here there's no dialectical uh and what is the advantage of that well, the advantage of that is when you have this writing in this way, all mass transmitted authentic readings can be put here and read here automatically. Okay, all mass transmissions can be read here automatically and you would know something is mass transmitted or not mass transmitted by looking at the original Writing. Why is the writing important now? Let me explain that to you. Because the writing of the Quran in the form of a book, while people are reciting Quran in various variant readings, okay, according to their, uh, you know, their lahja, according to their way of reciting. So somebody's reading one way here. Somebody's reading one way here. The most simple example I like to give people is Maliki Omidin versus Maliki Omidin. Somebody's reading Maliki Omidin, somebody's reading Maliki Omidin. How can we confirm that that mass now because the people are teaching? And so how can we confirm? Well, there has to be some way. This is the Quran, right? So the Quran is confirming by giving it to you in writings without the dialectical critical marks, showing what that as long as it is, be, it can be read within, without the diacritical marks, okay? without the diacritical marks, as long as it can be read, it is correct. Okay, so without the diacritical marks, you can read Maliki Omiddin or Maliki Omiddin. Okay, without the diacritical marks, you can read Innahu la ilmu sa'a or Innahu la alamu sa'a. Both ways you can read because there's no diacritical marks. So the person 
automatically knows. And so you can tell which mass transmitted riwayat were authentic by having this system in place. Okay, and I'm going to go into much more details about this because this is a very, very important subject that people need to understand and people that want to understand it really have to like look at a few other things that I want to uh, explain. We are not, there are many different akhbar because these are not riwayat about who actually started the dots and the diacritical marks. So there are many different reports, okay, about who actually started this. And you're going to see, it's so miraculous if you think about it. The Prophet is teaching people different, according to their different situations and their different modes of reading. Okay, you can read it according to this. You can read it like this. And you can read it like this. And you can read it like this. If I have time, I'll show you the ahadith on this, okay? But if I don't, then you can do your research. Inshallah, you know, uh, we're all responsible for being not intellectually lazy. So if I say something that didn't fill in the gap, then you can do research on that, okay? So uh, it's so amazing that the Prophet ﷺ taught people different but similar ways of recitation. And here's a book that is going to be spacious enough because of not having diacritical marks. Because of not having dots, but specifically diacritical marks. Because of that, it's spacious enough that what? Spacious enough to uh, contain within it all the mass transmitted narrations. Now, not every narration of riwaya of Kira is authentic. No. And one of the ways to know if it's authentic or not is if it, it can be read using the text of the original text. Okay, which I'm going to talk a little bit about that if I have time, that which of the Qira'as is closest to the Qurayshi dialect, the Quraysh, the Qurayshi dialect. Okay, and uh, but before I go there, let me mention that there are many different riwayats and who uh, started the diacritical marks and putting let letters into the Qur'an. And so one of the riwayats are that, for example, Imam Sayyuti in his Itqad, he's mentioned that Ali radiallahu anh had uh, a man named Du'li, uh, Du'li, uh, to put in the dots. And then others say, no, it was Hassan Basri, under the, uh, under the commandment of, um, of Hijaj bin Yusuf. Others say, no, it was Malik bin Marwan. And others say it was others. So they're like, I think, four different uh, ideas or four different akhbar on it was this person or this person or this person. Okay. The point being that this, what does this show? It shows that even the dots, it went through different phases. Okay. And uh, even the diacritical marks went through different phases. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll be looking at that. Okay. Oh, uh, one important point is that did the dots and the dialectical Markism of Quran exist before the Quran? Well, many of the scholars have said no, it didn't exist before the Quran. And others said uh, that no. Uh, for example, one of the great scholars, I think Alama Qalqashkandi, uh, said that no, there are three individuals whose names I don't remember that actually had this. And because the other sister uh, languages of Arabic, like for example, Aramic and Syriac, in Hebrew, these were like sister languages uh, that uh, existed in Arabia at that time. Okay, and so because you know how Hebrew is, they say as, instead of Assalamu Alaikum, they say Shalom, right? So there's this like kind of like different variations of saying things are similar but different yeah, amongst these languages, and then amongst Arabic itself, there are different uh, versions you can say of how you would say things, uh, like. And, and, and we'll go into that, okay? So now, there were different... So, there's a difference of opinion on this, but it seems like that there these things were developed because one reason to say that is that they were also developed in the Hebrew language that had been because of the ulama of Bani Israel and so on and so forth in Syriac. The Christians were writing in, and they had developed these things. So, it looks like, it does seem like it's fair to say that the uh, the dots as well as the diacritical marks had been already become part of the Arabic language by the time the Quran was revealed.
So it's not surprising. For example, Warqa bin Nawafil, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari about him, right? That Kana Yaktubul Ibraniya, he used to write Ibrani, right? The the Hebrew language. Right? So writing uh, had become quite sophisticated uh, before the revelation of the Quran. And it's interesting in that respect. See, in that respect, it's very interesting that the, the dialectical marks, even though they existed, were not put on the Quran. Why were they not put on the Quran? Because uh, to allow the spaciousness of the different uh, readings of and the different what would later on be mass transmission of Quranic readings. Okay, this is something that I'm going to go into more detail a little bit, but just stay with me for a second. Now, there are different reports about who started the diacritical marks. Uh, the most authentic to me. Now, I could be wrong because I'm not uh, an expert in history like that. Okay, So I'm going to mention what seems right because I want to give the credit to Ali radiallahu anh, uh, because of it seems, and Allah knows best, but it seems just like he started Arabic grammar, uh, radiallahu anh. He also started, he also asked Abu Asad Du'li to start the diacritical marks on the Quran because the Arabs were beginning to read Quran wrong and there's a whole story about this uh, that but it, but because people started reading Quran wrong because they didn't there was no diacritical marks and they were not Arabs and they were reading Quran wrong and that was a big concern a very big concern and so something had to be done so uh, Abu Asad Du'li he started putting these diacritical marks but in the beginning they were not like in this in the same way we have it today as fata dama or kasra. No, that's not how they were. But um, they uh, the diacritical marks. First of all, the first phase of it seems to be that they only did it on what is called the arab, the last letter of the word, to tell it its status, so that it's not read wrong. Because the mistake, the original mistake that was made was on arab. Okay, instead of saying rasuluhu, he said rasulihi or I forget one of these. Uh, so the, the last letter is the most important to tell if it's the subject, if it's the object, or it's in the genetic case. So they only put the arab in the beginning. It seems this way. Okay. Then later on, they put it on the whole word. Okay. But they were trying their best to not put it on the whole the whole wor word. Okay, but of course there were a lot of non-Arabs accepting Islam and it was the need of the time. But what happened, that same original Quran that could be read by mass transmission, as you will see in, in a second. Okay, that same Quran that would be able to be read by mass transmission, now when you're putting diacritical marks, what will happen? It'll become limited to a specific form of recitation, even though it would be authentic. But here's where we have to talk about people like Alama Suyuti rahmatullah alayhi, uh, when they wrote Jalalain and how they chose different dialects and why. So we're going to talk about that in, uh, in just a bit. So at first they didn't use Fatata Makasa, they used dots. Sometimes uh, it seems that, you know, some of them they had used hollow dots, sometimes they used solid dots. And so if there was a dot on top, it was Fatha. If there was a dot on the bottom, it was Kasra. If it was a dot in front of the letter, uh, it would mean Dhamma. Okay, so this is how it was originally. Let me just uh, see if I can show you a copy of that, inshallah ta'ala. So here's an example of the text where they would put dots and always they would put the ink in one color and the dots in another color. So like the ink was black and the dots would be red to separate the Quran from the dots. Okay, so that was a very, very important thing that was being done in the very early on. Okay, so um, okay, so now let me continue. And, and oh, by the way, you can see where the two dots are. The two dots was to show gunna. Okay, so that that the two dots would be used to show gunna. Okay, so there's the dots that were used in a different color to show this is not Quran. Okay, because the original writing of the Sahaba, in which there was the ijma of the Sahaba, that was used to. Uh, show the expansiveness and the dynamicness of mass transmission. Okay, it was open to that. Here's another example. And I would read this for you, but I don't have time right now. I just want to make the points. Then later on, I'm going to do one in which I'm going to show 
uh, other interesting things, inshallah, as time goes by. But you can see the red marks are separated from the text. And they're, you know, the text uh, doesn't have dots. So all that is being done is a the arab and the ghunnas are being set in the beginning. Okay? And then, after that, according to some of the riwayat, Hassan Basri was included in that. Diacritical marks were put in the way that we have it in Fatah al Kasra with a line by Hassan Basri and others, and Allah knows best. So they put these diacritical marks uh, on to the pages of the Quran. Okay, so now uh, before I go further, I want to, uh, inshallah, I hope this makes uh, some very important points clear, that the diacritical marks were not part of the original, and the original had the capacity to contain within it mass transmission. And so, uh, we will now take that, inshallah, a little bit further, okay? So, Bismillah, I found this video that I think I can use here. It's called The Seven Ahraf and the Ten Qiraat of Qur'an Explained, okay? I think he's done a pretty good job to make the basic points. And what I want you to keep in mind, what I'm trying to show you here is that when you will can see the times where the text is intact regardless of recitation and other times the text is not in contact so that's why the scholars would prefer sometimes one to the other one recitation to the other recitation so let i have basically three more things to show but let's watch this video and then i'll try to make my notes as short as possible inshallah okay that do you say privacy or privacy or color or color right garage or garage obviously this is all correct english and these are but variations with exact same meaning english is naturally not the only language that contains variations like these arabic as well has different variations depending on where the language is spoken since the holy quran was revealed in arabic it too had variations within and this video will tackle the concept of variations in the holy quran so let's get started by answering the first question what are the seven ahraf of quran and what does even harf mean at the time of the revelation of the Holy Quran, there were many different variations of the Arabic language. People used different pronunciations, and they spelled words differently, and sometimes the grammatical structure of the sentences had variations too. For this reason, the Holy Quran was not revealed in one variation, but in seven. Each of these variations is called harf. When the Quran was revealed, it was revealed with all seven variations at the same time. So harf has mostly to do with certain narration saying the prophet allowed it this way or or certain companion of the prophet recited it this way okay qira is a whole system of recitation like abu hanifa is a person's name right and so you had for example uh, asim bin hafs who is a, also a name because he he chose okay he chose certain recitations so now let's continue with that in time we call them the seven ahruf or in Arabic, Al-Ahruf al saba So these Ahruf represent seven variations of some words in the Holy Quran. So each difference, no matter how minute or minuscule it is, it goes directly back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Therefore, these variations are not up to us. So there is no, and has never been... Some Ahruf are authentic, some are not authentic. So some do go back to the Prophet, some do not go back to the Prophet. Any space for us... For so how will we know? Even if they go back to the Prophet, then we still have to look at the text. Okay, and I think uh, uh, Mufti Taqi Usmani, uh, he recently, um, or at some point, gave this fatwa also, that not all ihraf are authentic, and that it has to be consistent with the original text. Using our own variations of the Holy Quran. So why do these ahruf, and that is, by the way, the plural of harf, why do they exist? There are mainly three reasons why there are variations of the Holy Quran. First, it is there to make it easier for people with different dialects to read and recite the Quran without any problems. Like in this example, what you see in this ayah is a variation in the last word. Notice and hear the difference between how the last word is pronounced. وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى since some dialects did not use Hamzat Qatwa in this position, it is acceptable to drop it, making it easier for those who already speak this tongue. Another example to confirm the point. 
So again, there are some differences between these two examples. They are the exact same ayah. Second, is that some of these variations that we see in the Holy Quran, they actually add another dimension without contradicting one another, like in this example. If you notice, without the dialectical marks, there's no difference. But if you put the dialectical marks, there's a difference. Without them, there's no difference. And one Sahabi may read it one way, another Sahabi may read it another way, depending upon what, what the Prophet allowed and what he taught. In the first variation of the word, the word Qutilu is translated to have been killed, which would make the meaning of the verse as follows. And the deeds of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah will not go to waste. But then looking at the second variation of the ayah, we see that the word Qatalu means have fought which would make the meaning of the ayah as follows. And the deeds of those who have fought in the cause of Allah will not go to waste. As we can see, it adds a miraculous dimension to the ayah, adding and enriching its meaning. So the deeds of those who have been killed and those who just fought in the cause of Allah will not go to waste. So the variations here added another dimension without contradicting the one that is already there. And the third reason is that it is to tighten the challenge made against those who don't believe in the Holy Quran. That still, with different variations, the Holy Quran is consistent and only gets rich Assalamu alaikum. Listen, if you click on this ad, I will show you how from November 25th to November to December 1st, sure, and more challenging without contradictions and without any mistakes. The next question is what kind of changes are there when we talk about the seven ahruf or in Arabic al ahruf as -sara? What kind of changes can we expect? Now, the variations may involve difference in nouns. That, for example, in one variation, a word is mentioned in the plural form and another it is mentioned in the singular form, like in this example. And notice again, between the plural and the singular, there's no difference if you take out the tashkil, right? It's only with the tashkil that it looks like, oh, well, one is plural, the other is singular. It's a big difference, big problem. Oh my God, no. Without the tashkil, the Sahaba read it according to what they were taught by the Prophet. And the original is the Qurayshi dialect in most of these instances, which I will talk about maybe in my next video. But in this video, I want you to see, even though, right, it seems like it's different if you're listening. But if you're looking at the text, there's no difference. The text, the written text, is spacious enough to have both recitations. And there are some exceptions of that, by the way. So the word amanatihim, that is plural, and the word amanatihim, that is singular. Another type of difference is a grammar difference, like difference between the conjugation of verbs, like in this example. Now again, even though there, there's a grammatical difference, but there's no difference in the script. Isn't that miraculous when you think about it? Right? So that is, that is very amazing. And of course, these two verbs mean the same thing, but it is only how different people say the same thing. Another type of variation is the absence or the addition of a word. And this is one of its examples. Now, this one, when it comes to this type of change, where there's a whole word, huwa, missing from the text, versus the one that's not missing, this becomes a little bit more, uh, based upon the strength of the riwayah, based upon the strength of the riwayah, becomes more questionable. Based upon, if you say the criteria is, if you say the criteria is, that it has to be equal to the written text and the oral text have to match. Okay? Even though, honestly speaking, from me knowing Arabic language, it's like, huwa could be mahzuf. And that's something that, Meaning it's understood. It's understood, but it, it's not said. Okay? And that can also be certainly the case, which is sometimes why the scholars chose one 
reading over another reading, which I'm going to make a video about that maybe tomorrow. Notice here that the change is merely syntactic, meaning that it doesn't affect the meaning of the ayat, but just the choice of words to say the same thing. Last is some differences in the application of the Tajweed rules, like in this example. Another example. وَاتْلُ مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ كِتَابِ رَبِّكَ وَاتْلُ مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ كِتَابِ رَبِّكَ Now that you understand what a harf is in the Holy Quran, why it exists, and what kind of variations there are linked to each harf, now let's find out what are qira'at then. The word qira'at is a plural of the word qira'at, which translates into a way of recitation of the Holy Quran. So a qira'ah is a way of recitation that is attributed to a qira'ah master. So qira'ah is just the selection that the qira'ah master has made based on the variations of the seven ahuf. So somebody was an, asp an expert of recitation, but he was also an expert of understanding the original text and how the original text should be read according to the mass transmissions that were taught by the Prophet ﷺ. So a qira'ah is a whole system of recitation based upon what they chose. This is why every major Qira master had two students that recited in two different ways. So there were seven masters, and from the seven masters you had two each. Let's look at an example to understand this point fully. In the first surah of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatiha, we can see that there are many variations that we can choose from. These variations, as we have understood, represent the seven ahraf of the Qur'an. Of course, I'm going to give you an example of the variations of Surah Al-Fatiha. This is not everything there is. For example, the word Malik, you could say it as Malik or Malik. And in the seventh verse, the word Sirat, it starts with a Sad. Some variations of the word Sirat in this position is turning the Sad into Sin. So you would say Sirat. But some variations as well will turn the Sad in this position to an almost Zay. So you would say Zirat. So And that is completely phonetical. Which is understood within the context of its writing, because that's how they would read the Sa'd. Oh, here we have three choices only in this word. Moving on a little bit further with the word alayhim. Now we can say alayhum, alayhumu. So as we can see, there are many choices that are available that we can choose from. Now the Qira'a master has made certain decisions and will choose from these available variations of this surah. The product of his selections will be called a Qira'a. So a selection of variations equals Qira'a. There are 10 confirmed masters of Qira'at, and all of them combined cover all the seven ahuf. You can find the list of the masters of the Qira'at in this poster, which you can download from the description of this video. So, so if you see, every one of these Qira'at masters had two students, and they, they gave each of the two students slightly different uh, choices. And then from there, there were more. The masters of Qira'at are the only 10 confirmed masters that are directly linked to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Each one of these masters has two confirmed students, and each one of these two <coughs> students has learned and specialized in a distinct variation of the Holy Quran. These students are called Rami, or narrator. So, for example, Asim al Kufi has made a number of decisions and selections from the seven Ahruf of the Quran, and he taught it to two of his students, and they are Hafs and Shu'bah. And today we have the Qira'ah of Hafs and Asim, which is one of the most famous Qira'at nowadays which means that Hafs is therefore the student of Asim. And, and I'm going to talk about this maybe at another time, but this is a very important topic. The Hafs Qira is the closest Qira to the Qurayshi dialect, number one. It is the Qira that is all over the Muslim world. It was known as Qira'atul Amma, okay? And it is, it, all, it is the one that everyone has memorized the Qur'an with for the most part. Okay, majority of the memorization is in Hafs. But I'm going to talk about that at another time. Can you still choose from other Qira'as? Yes. But the one that would be closest to the original text of the Qurayshi dialect would have a precedence over other forms of Qira most of the time. And so when these people were, were teaching their students different, so he taught Hafs a little differently, he taught Shu'ba a little bit differently. Asim taught the two differently. Why? Because of the choices that were available. Why were there more so many choices available? Because the Prophet had taught it to different people according to their dialects. Okay? And they chose based upon what they knew to be authentic versus what fit 
in the script, the kitab, the book, the ijma of the sahaba. So like this, they had many choices and they taught their students to each. Aslam is the one who made the selections from the available variations of the Quran. Now the students of the students are called tariq or method. So the students of Hafs are then called tariq. Let's have a look at an example that involves the qira'ah of Asim from two different narrators. So the first one will be Hafs an Asim, and the second one will be Shu'bah an Asim. So now, so now you see, the text remains the same, but the recitation is different because the text, the written text, that the Quran had told from the beginning had the spaciousness without the dialectical marks to contain both of these recitations and others. Now you might be thinking, well, these people have made choices based on the Sivan Ahav. Can't I just have my own choices in reciting the book? Ready to start eating healthier? Meet Kachava. Kachava is the world's healthiest Quran. And the answer is yes. You can actually pick and choose what you want from the variations of the Quran. Because it is all Quran and it is all confirmed and can be traced back to the Prophet peace be upon him. And now you would think, well, since Ahav is just another word for dialects, can we just use the contemporary dialects that we have nowadays for Arabic to read the Holy Quran? And the answer is definite no, that is impossible. The choices that Allah has made for us are made this way for a reason. The variations of the Holy Quran do not contradict one another and do not change the meaning. And of but course the dialects today wouldn't fit the text at all. <laughs> Zero. You know, not, not the Yamani, not the Sudani, not any of them would ever fit the text that the, that the companions of the Prophet uh, assembled or arranged. Okay. But if we, for example, want to use, uh, let's say, Sudanese dialects, and some of the dialects in Sudan, they turn Qaf into Ghayn. So they would read this ayah completely differently. <laughs> and of course, the word Ghadr is completely different from the original ayah, which is Al Qadr. So this would change the meaning. Or if you want to use the Egyptian dialect of Arabic. <laughs> it's actually funny. Ghadr, uh, one of the meanings is to deceive. So we sent it down in the night of deception. Astaghfirullah. Okay. And would say, وَمِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجْتْ Now, of course, in the Egyptian Arabic, they turn jim into ga. And this would be very confusing for some dialects in Yemen that actually understand ga as qaf. So, if they hear the word kharagt, they would think it is actually kharakt, which would completely change the meaning and it means to destroy confusions. And one last example is that some Turkish brothers, they, is that they exchange the letter ta into ba. And that is actually a mistake because they would read وَحَفِظْنَاهَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ But the problem is, if you come across an ayah like this, and you would apply this rule to it, you would completely change the meaning of the ayah to a point that is completely unacceptable. قُلْ أَضِيعُ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ So this verse that means obey Allah and His Messenger, now it would mean leave Allah and His Messenger. Of course, أَضِيعُ is a completely different word than أَضِيعُ. So the contemporary variations of the Arabic language nowadays cannot be used to read the Holy Quran. Now here are some of the most important sources for those who are interested in learning about the differences between Qira'at and if you want to add variations to your recitation. Alright, so the first source that we will talk about today is mqur'an.com. So I'm just going to stop it here and then we'll look at mqur'an.com uh, a little bit later. So this is going to be the, uh, you can say, the first uh part of this series and then inshallah i'll complete tomorrow the second part of this series so quran before diacritical marks the miraculousness of it the spaciousness of it and how it confirms which qiraas are valid versus not so valid and how all mass transmissions meet this standard and if you think about what amazing thing the prophet did because the prophet was there and the Prophet wanted to make Quran easy. And he made tried and he made it easy by allowing them to recite according to in a in a fashion that would be easy for them. Okay? And then he had it in so now people are reciting Quran in these different ways. Okay. And now after twenty years or so, or after not twenty years, but uh, about almost uh, yeah, twenty some years. Now, Abu Bakr puts the Qur'an together, okay, in a way that doesn't have diacritical marks. And these different ways that the Prophet taught would be able to be read. And the, the book 
فإذا لا تحرك لسانك لتعجل بي إن علينا جمعه وقرآن It's on us to gather it and have it recited And now this Qur'ayshi dialect This Qur'anic Qur'ayshi uh, dialect is the main dialect from which people would recite And which one is that? That is Hafs That's the recitation of Hafs Which is closest to the Qur'ayshi dialect Which I'm not going to talk about today I might talk about it tomorrow But I wanted everyone to understand that it is very common and that actually part uh, I can actually show you uh, if I just show you this then I don't think there's a need to do one tomorrow let me quickly show you this this is very important and this is about how uh, Imam Suyuti okay you chose between different dialects within his tafsir and it, just as the Qiraz, the Qaris, they chose different dialects to, uh, to their, they taught them to their students and each student was taught two different dialects because there were so many choices and they were taught based upon what they thought was the best of those choices. Okay. And so Imam Suyuti, when he is doing his tafsir, he's also choosing, okay, uh, the different dialects of the Quran, he's, he's using the different Qira'as uh, of Quran in his tafsir. Okay, so uh, so for example, you when when he when the ayah yuqadiruna amanu, right? So this wama yuqadiruna illa anfusahum. He uses two different Qira'as in talking about this aspect. Then uh, in the second instance, the read the readers Nafi bin Kathir and Abu Amr Basri read, and and it goes on. Right, so Imam Suyuti again, okay, uh, then Shaytan Iblis caused them to slip, he caused them to be removed. And if so, instead of فَأَزَلَّهُمُ Shaytan, right, فَأَزَلَّهُمَا, right, versus فَأَزَلَّهُمَا, أَزَلَّهُمَا, he caused them to be forgotten, okay, he caused them to be forgotten versus he caught them to be slipped. This is now what Imam Suyuti has in the verb. Zalla, okay, fa'azalla, and in this uh, in this example, Imam Suyuti's commentary indicates the reading fa'azallahuma, the second verb, the verbal form of the verb zalla means to cause to be removed, and this conforms to the reading of Abu Amr. Again, both of these would be conformed to the original text, the written text, right? And then uh, there are so many examples. Uh, again, Imam, Imam Suyuti's comments are based upon the reading of the adjective as Hasanan versus Husanan. Okay, there's a difference in the dialectical mark. Husunan versus Hasanan. Okay, and uh, this is again in Surah Baqarah. Qulu linnasi husna. Okay, that, that part of the Quran. Then Imam Suyuti, by the way, why am I choosing Imam Suyuti to say this? And this is in, this is full in hadith literature. And this is full of tafsirs where the scholars are choosing one kira over another kira, one kira over another kira, one kira over another kira, but always hafs seems to be the standard. Kira'atul amma. Okay. So, so, uh, so for example, in this reading, okay, uh, for example, in this reading of Nansa ha, okay, is adapted by Imam Suyuti. This is clearly evident from his interpreting the word to mean postpone, okay, instead of to forget. And his regarding as variant of nunsiha, meaning cause to forget, from the verbal for, uh, verbal noun uh, nasyan, nasyan, and reading of nansa ha, is transmitted only by two famous readers, Ibn Kathir and Abu Amr. He uses Imam Suyuti uses Abu Ahmad quite often. Okay, this tells us that Suyuti was complying with either one of these readings, meaning either by the reading of Ibn Kathir or Abu Amr. And he's doing this while he's doing his tafsir. He's choosing other dialects to explain his tafsir. Okay, and there are many many examples of this. Okay, uh, the above five examples show that the the commentary of Imam Suyuti does not correspond to the reading of Hafs all the time. Despite this, nearly all of the printed recent editions, they tried to do that. Furthermore, we study the examples of the variant readings brought to our attention by Imam Suyuti. Okay? And so, why is Imam Suyuti doing 
something sometimes in this reading and sometimes explaining the next ayah in another reading and the next ayah in another reading but overall using hafs you can say because this was understood amongst the early generations and what's interesting is imam sayyuti is a primary book of tafsir primary primary first book of tafsir a student has to study in the madrasa okay but uh, in this example abu amr is alone in reading okay so sometimes it's a reading and it's out of the seven maybe two have adapted it or three have adapted it but sometimes he uses a reading only done by one because he felt that is the one that is most authentic in that place okay so we continue inshallah ta'ala uh on, the only reading that uh, that have uh, tara as suyuti takes it uh are those of nafi and uh, and uh, uh and uh, nafi and uh amir and yaqub so he's talking about why that in these verses he used these kiras in these verses he used these kiras so anyone that's familiar with jalalain will know that because every scholar has been taught jalalain and i think every scholar was given an introduction to the fact that imam jalal uh, the tafsir jalalain because it's written by two people is they both used different kiras to explain different verses they chose but all of those were what they didn't contradict contradict the original writing without its dialect without the diacritical marks they didn't contradict that they couldn't contradict that okay now there are exceptions to this which i will talk about inshallah at another time but for the most part uh, this is what the scholars did they chose between the qiras that did not contradict the because some of the things that we got considered qiras where the complete word was changed or sometimes the verb the tense was changed which differed from the text so some scholars have said no that was actually in uh, to do kind of like a tafsir or some a different word kasaf al manfush instead of kal ihn al manfush was used for example that was more like a tafsir that was added by a companion in order to explain the ayah but not uh, had, had didn't have to do with qira because it didn't correspond to the book that was written by the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which i've said that the the qira that's closest to that is hafs qira okay but the written form was there as a template to be able to because now for 20 years the sahaba have been reading there could be some issue so you have the standard text that abu bakr and uthman made from which this can be filtered and yes that would give you which qiraas are authentic and which qiraas are not authentic in addition to the fact which of the qiraas have mass transmission going back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i think uh i'll see what comments people have but i think this is good enough for people to have an understanding that from early on the teachers themselves chose between one recitation to another recitation as long as it conformed to the book inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana fa idha qara'nahu fattabi' qur'ana and then later on the mufassirin also chose between different qira's as long as it conformed to the book so it went from oral reading dependence only to then primarily book dependent as primary this is why if you read from the mushaf they say there's more thawab more reward reading from the book of allah reading from the mushaf right and last point i want to make before i go when allah said inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr we have sent down the dhikr wa inna lahu lahafizun and we're going to protect it notice that if i say okay here's a, here's a quran okay here's a here's a quran okay this quran what is the quran is it the paper is it the ink which part is the quran is it the covering no it's the it's the it's not any of the it's the it's the dhikr it's the words in it but which words it's the words without the diacritical mark without the surah name without mentioning if it's makir madni without mentioning the surah number without mentioning the number of the ayat those that when you remove the diacritical mark it actually becomes a script in which majority 99.9% of all of the authentic riwayat could be read with the uh, condition that you know the the the, the qiraas and you know 
the how to read without the dialectical marks. But you wouldn't, if you have a Qadi who knows all of them, he would be able to do it quite easily because he already knows it and he can already identify. Okay, so if you had only the letters with the dia, without the diacritical marks and without the muds and without the alifs, okay, the elongated alifs, without all of that, all of the qira'as should fit into that reading. Okay, so I have, inshallah, said something that is beneficial and miraculous and dynamic and I hope you can now relate to why this topic was important. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.